Let's start lecture B by just quickly reviewing what we did in lecture A with our models. First, we had the cash flow with interest problem. Uh, in Mathematica, we dealt with that. And here we made, well, by hand, we solved the equation with separation of variables. We found a general solution of the form 50,000 plus C to the point zero two T. And then we made the slope field for that using vector plot up here, where I had to put the right-hand side of the differential equation in the second spot. During break, I added a plot of my solution for different Cs. The C we found for our initial value problem was 50,000, so that'll be the starting solution for this C, but then I'll be able to change the value of C here. There's our particular solution curve. The zero is right there. We're at $100,000 to start with. That's how our money is growing when the interest rate is 2% annual, compounded continuously, and when we are withdrawing $1,000 per year at a continuous rate. Different C's give you different solutions, though. And there are initial conditions for low enough values of C. C, by the way, here is not the same as the initial value here. Let me go down to zero here. For low enough values of C in that formula, actually negative values of C, I should have known that, where the solution can decrease and head towards zero. If your initial deposit is less than 15 dollars in the situation, you will eventually run out of money. The uh, mixing problem, had a differential equation, but that was this one. It's on the board as well. The AT equals 12 minus 5A over 10 plus T. I said you can't solve that equation by separation of variables, so we do not know how to solve it, and I'm not going to teach you how to solve it. If you take DPQ in the spring, I will teach you how to solve an equation like this. But we had Mathematica solve it with this initial condition. The initial amount of salt is zero. We got this function. Pretty amazing that it's such a long polynomial on top. You can certainly plot that function to see how the amount of salt changes as a function of time. And interesting thing about it is it's not only increasing, but it's concave down. So the amount of salt initially goes up very rapidly, and then it kind of heads toward almost a straight line going up. I think intuitively, perhaps, that's happening because well, maybe I better not get into intuition. Okay, let's just trust this. I better not, I'll get myself into trouble. Down here during break, I solved for an arbitrary initial value. I called it A0, and got this function. And then I plotted all those functions in the slope field, just like for the other example, with a minute delay. There's our particular solution for our particular initial condition of zero. But if I increase the amount of salt to start with, then I get different solutions. You can see that initial amount change as I change A0. The graph doesn't change that much, does it? It's a pretty similar graph overall. Seems like the end behavior is pretty similar. If I let the amount of salt go even higher, though, I don't know, up to 100 or something, It's actually the case that the amount of salt can decrease at first before it increases. That's maybe unexpected. If you've got a lot of salt to begin with, the amount can actually decrease. Well. Why is that intuitive, though? Evidently, for initial conditions up here, the concentration of salt in the tank is higher than 2 grams per liter. And therefore, that's the reason, and related to the flow rates as well. It, it combines with the flow rates in kind of a complicated way. There's more salt leaving initially than is coming in when your initial amount of salt is, is sufficiently high. So that's maybe unexpected. It decreases before it increases again. But the same sort of end behavior, it seems like no matter what our initial condition, 
after 40 minutes has gone by, we're going to have close to 100 grams of salt, unless the initial amount of salt was really hot. Then it might not be real close to 100, but it, I'd probably have to go real high before that, before it changed appreciably over here. So th those are, I think, those are really interesting things to, to learn about these systems that you wouldn't necessarily expect. It's always cool when unexpected things happen because that tells you something new that you wouldn't necessarily expect. Differential equations can tell you new things. All right, in lecture B for the rest of time today. We're going to go back to systems of differential equations. Just like that, that predator prey model with the rabbits and foxes that I showed you in the plane at the beginning of lecture A, we are going to be analyzing these systems of differential equations in a plane. It's called a phase plane. Our first example from Monday. The last lecture was this system of differential equations. It was for a mass and a spring. X was the position of the mass back and forth. Its derivative is the velocity, so one of the equations in our system was dx dt equals v. The derivative of the velocity is the acceleration. And we saw by Newton's second law that that was the force divided by m, really the force coming from Hooke's law, the equation ended up being, ended up being this negative k over m times, times x. Okay? So that's a system of differential equations. In Mathematica, d solve and d solve value, we've been mostly using d solve value, can handle systems as well. Let's go ahead and put this system of differential equations into Mathematica. We solved this system for one initial condition, one pair of initial conditions last time. You got some initial position, x of 0 equals x of 0, or it is x sub 0 on the board. And v of 0, which is x prime of 0, equals v sub 0. I picked an initial position of 1. <coughs> and initial velocity of zero last time, corresponding to pulling the mass one meter to the right and letting it go from rest. Don't hit it with a hammer. Don't push it or pull it before you let it go. Just let it go from rest. Let's see if we can get Mathematica to handle this uh, for an arbitrary initial condition. And maybe an arbitrary k and m as well. Will you have to solve such an equation? No. Okay? Though once we get a solution, you should be able to verify that it works. So the first equation again is x prime of t equals v, but you need to emphasize to Mathematica that v is a function of t. Second equation is v prime of t equals equals negative k over m times x of t. Again, double equal signs are necessary, square brackets, our own function arguments are necessary. That's the way to type that system in here. I think, you know, this is a new session of Mathematica from last time, so K and M don't have any values, but to play it safe, it doesn't hurt to sort of clear your variables ahead of time like that. That doesn't, that never hurts. Make sure they don't have set values, because otherwise you get errors. Plug in your arbitrary initial condition x0 equals, x of 0 equals x0. I won't do a subscript on Mathematica, though I could. And the derivative of x, which is v, at time 0 equals v sub 0 or v0. This time, though, there are two functions to solve for, x and v as functions of time. I need to solve for the pair of functions. So I need to put them in a list like that. I'm solving for both x and v. I'm solving the system of equations simultaneously. That's the syntax. I'm not sure how complicated this is going to look when I enter this. But I'm sure it's going to involve cosines and sines. I'm sure of that. There it is. Pretty complicated.
Um, we can use this for any initial value problem, it's going to give you the solution. We could, let, let me do the following. Let me go ahead and give these functions names. I'll call x as a function of time, I'll call it f of t. But I've got these four <coughs> parameters, k, m, x0, and v0, that I want to use and manipulate to change what happens. So I'm going to do this, I'm going to use my subscripts in a way that I often do to allow myself to change these parameters. This is a function of time here, but it involves four parameters. That's going to be x as a function of time, the first function you see here. And here's the beauty of copy and paste. I don't have to type all that. Copy, paste. What about v as a function of time? I guess I'll call that g. I can copy and paste this and make appropriate modifications. Change the f to a g. Well, and change this formula to this formula. That will enter these functions in mathematical. I also, as I mentioned last time, could think of this as a parametric curve. This pair of functions is a parametric curve. Let me call that curve C of t, but I better use subscripts again. C of t. It's a parametric curve, which you can think of it as a point whose first coordinate is f and whose second coordinate is g. I can use lists in Mathematica to get those in here, but I don't use any underscores anymore because I'm, I've defined those functions already. So I just go f sub k comma m comma x0 comma v0 with no underscores because I've already defined that function. Remember, you only use the underscores when you're first defining the function. Here's g. Now these functions are entered. Now I can make my graphs with manipulate. And watch what happens as I change parameters. There's two kinds of graphs I can make. I can make graphs of f and g as functions of time. Let me go ahead and do that first. I can also make parametric plots of these things. The graph of c row talked about parametric curves before, but I'm going to make a regular plot first. To copy and paste this list, this is what I'm plotting. I'm plotting both of those functions as functions of time. How far should t go? I don't really know offhand. Let's initially try to let t go up to, say, 10. Let's color these things differently. I'm going to let f be colored red, that is my x, my position. And I'll color g blue, that is going to be my velocity. Plot range in the vertical direction, I don't know what to use. Let's try negative 10 to 10 at first. All these things kind of depend on what I pick for kn, x0, and v0. And I don't know offhand what would be realistic values for these things. I mean, m, you know, if m is 1, that's 1 kilogram. But what is k? I don't know what a realistic value for typical springs would be. I'll try 0.1 to start with. Let it go down to 0 0.01 and up to 10, say. m will start at 1, go down to 0 0.1 and up to 10. X0 is the initial position. I'll start that at 1, let it go down as low as negative 2 and as high as positive 2. And V0 is the initial velocity. I'll start that at 0, let it go as low as negative 2 and as high as 2. So this should graph ordinary graphs, not parametric curves. Ordinary function, graphs of functions. X is a function of time and V is a function of time. And there they are. Let's do it over a bigger range of values. Let's go out to uh, 100 instead of 10. So the red graph, that's the position. The blue graph, that's the velocity, the derivative of the graph. So the position here, the initial position is 1. The initial velocity is 0. I'm pulling it 1 meter and letting it go from rest. The red graph keeps track of the back and forth motion, the position. 
The blue graph, again, is the derivative of the red. It's telling you the velocity. It looks like the velocity never gets bigger than about half a meter a second or something. Maybe even lower than that, 0.2 or 0.3 meters per second. But if I change m and k, these graphs will change. And think about it. I forgot what we found last time. The, the solution to that second order equation involved cosine and sine of and the input of the cosine and sine involved, I think it was square root of k over m times t. Yeah, that was it. Let's put them all over here. Nice. The period of the motion is 2 pi over square root of k over m. That was an equation I wrote down last time, which is the same as 2 pi times square root of m over k. And the frequency is the reciprocal of that. One over two pi times the square root of k over m. So if I increase k, for example, make the spring stiffer, what's going to happen? The period is going to go down if I increase k. The frequency goes up. That's a faster oscillation. If I increase k, I should see the period decrease, I should see faster oscillation. On the other hand, m plays the opposite role. Increasing m increases the period and decreases the frequency. If I increase m, it's a slower oscillation. And then changing the initial position and initial velocity does just that, changes the initial position and initial velocity. Is it accurate? Well, in the idealized situation with no friction, it's probably decently accurate for a small amount of time. Of course, there's always friction. If nothing else, there's internal friction from the atoms in the spring, molecules in the spring, at the very least. So it's not going to be accurate in the long term. The other kind of plot I can make with this is a parametric plot. So do parametric plot. Actually, I could leave this the same in parametric plot. However, I don't want to leave it the same for some other purposes. So I'm going to call it, I'm just going to use my definition of C here. C is that list. Oops, with the subscripts. The function C is the list whose first entry is F and whose second entry is G. If I just enter a C here, I am essentially entering the list. I am plotting that now with the parametric plot instead of regular plot. My plot range this time. Remember, with parametric curves, you're plotting in, say, an xy plane, or in this case, an xv plane. My plot range like this won't work anymore. I need something more like this. x is going to go from negative 10 to 10, and v is going to go from negative 10 to 10. This is a range of values for t. What happens with parametric curves? They get traced out as time goes by in a plane involving some other variables, in this case, x and v. Uh, I am only making one graph, so I don't want two different colors here. This will plot the entire curve. There it is, an oval, an ellipse. Different curves to different k and m. Hmm, I think it's becoming inaccurate to some degree because we're sort of seeing some thickness there. Well, okay, it, it resolves itself a little better when you, when you stop changing K or M. But remember, with parametric curves, on your calculator it's nice, you see it being traced out, not necessarily at a constant speed. In Mathematica, it doesn't do that automatically, so we have to do something else to animate time. 
So add a B in here, as we've done before, starting at, say, 0 0.001 and going up to some specific time, like 100 or something. Maybe I'll pick a smaller one, like 10 now this time. Change this last value of T to a B now. We're adding one extra animation parameter. Now we'll see the curve itself get traced out. Maybe I should zoom in closer to the origin as well. We see the curve itself get traced out. Sometimes slow, sometimes fast. I better go past 10 here. And remember the warning I gave you at the end of the last class. This is not the motion of the mass. The mass of the spring is going back and forth. It's not moving in some ellipse. That's not what this is showing. This is related to the motion of the mass. At any moment in time, the spot you happen to be at, at the curve, the point you're at, tells you the position of the mass and the velocity. The x-coordinate, the first coordinate here of the point, anywhere I stop it, at time 5.767, the x coordinate is around negative 0.25, negative 0.3 or so. The mass is at that moment in time negative 0.2 or negative 0.3 meters to the left of the equilibrium position. And the velocity at that moment in time is negative, uh, ne uh, close to the same thing, negative 0.3 or so meters per second. It's moving in that direction at a speed of positive 0.3 meters per second. But it's moving to the left, so it's a negative velocity. At any moment in time, this tells you the state of the system. Sometimes it's called state space, but almost always I call it a phase space. Um, and it's a plane, so it's a phase plane. Sometimes this curve moves slow, like I said. Sometimes it's moving fast. When it's moving slowly, that's just telling you the state of the system is moving relatively slowly. And when it's moving fast, the, the system, the variables in the system are changing rapidly. This curve moves slowest near the left and right endpoints of the ellipse when the mass is furthest from equilibrium. And it moves fastest at the bottom and the top when the mass is passing through its equilibrium. The state of the system is changing most rapidly as the mass passes through equilibrium. Not always necessarily because the speed of the mass is fastest, but in this case it is. And the state of the system is changing most slowly at the end. One thing we're going to do with this that's not typically done in differential equations is we are going to attach velocity vectors and acceleration vectors to this kind of picture as a way of reminding ourselves what velocity vectors and acceleration vectors are. We're going to figure out speeds for this kind of thing and distance traveled. You should realize that when we do that, we are doing it just for fun, so to speak. Just to re-emphasize those concepts that I touched on briefly at the beginning of the semester. Not that an acceleration vector for this motion that you see in the phase plane has relevance, at least not obvious relevance, for the mass and the spring. I'm trying to bring in ideas about vectors and ultimately some stuff with multivariable calculus into differential equations, partially just to review those ideas. They do have some applications with the differential equations themselves, but partially I just want to review them. The last thing I want to do today, though, is I want to show you something else with this picture. Just as solution curves of the simpler kinds of differential equations, the single differential equations, follow a slope field, Solutions of systems of differential equations in a phase plane follow something called a vector field, which can also be made with vector plot in Mathematica, just like slope fields can. I can put the vector field in the same picture, and you still use vector plot for it. show. So the parametric plot is going to be inside the show. But 
I'm also going to put use vector plot inside the show. I'll put the vector plot first, and that's a good idea. You want to see the solution curve sort of on top of the vector field. So in Mathematica, the first thing you put sort of is in the background, and the second thing that's placed on top of it, graphically speaking. So put the vector plot first. With slope fields, we put a 1 in the first spot. With vector fields, you don't. With slope fields, we, in the second spot, put the right-hand side of the differential equation. With a system of two equations like this one, we use vector plot. The right-hand side of the first equation goes in the first spot, and the right-hand side of the second equation goes in the second spot. The right-hand side of the first equation there, you see on the board, is V. That goes in the first spot. The right-hand side of the second equation is negative K over M times X. That goes in the second spot. I am plotting this in this phase plane. Horizontal axis is X axis, vertical axis is V axis. And as far as the range of values for X and V, I should say what those are. And X should come first and V should come second. That is important. I am treating X as the first variable horizontally and V as the second vertical. And I can pick the same range of values I have for this plot range here, negative 5 to 5. Let's see what it looks like without any kind of formatting options here. There you see some, some vectors, some arrows in the background. The solution curve does follow the arrows, though they are very short arrows near the origin, so you can barely see any. If we started with an initial velocity that was relatively high, then you can see we're getting up toward the other arrows that are not so short. And letting t go up to only 20 doesn't go far enough to make this curve come back to where it started. Can I make this, the vector field look nicer? Yep. You can do vector scale again. And again, I always have to sort of fiddle with this. What comes next? I think 0 0.03 comma 1 comma none makes it look pretty good. Though I could be wrong, I'm always experimenting with that kind of thing. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Now we see the arrows pretty nicely. Solution curve is following them. Though when you're near the horizontal axis, those arrows look vertical. Actually, they're only vertical on the horizontal axis itself. Let's make the initial velocity bigger. Actually, in making this picture, we're making all the vectors have the same size. That's not the case, actually. They're being rescaled. I'm not telling you yet how the vector field is really made. Like, how would you make this by hand, for example? It would be a big pain. I think I'll save that for Friday. For the moment, just note to do what I told you to do. The right-hand side of the first equation in the system goes in the first spot, and the right-hand side of the second equation goes in the second spot. The dependent variable for the first, or first equation is the horizontal axis. The dependent variable for the second equation is the vertical axis. You have to keep track of those kind of details. All right. I will save this Mathematica on Moodle as I do once in a while, so you have access to the code. I think I probably will have you use Mathematica to make pictures like this and possibly even print up for the next assignment. Okay? All right, have a good day.